Hi, my name is Rich Hillsden. I'm a general surgeon and trauma surgeon. And we're gonna start off the bowel obstruction module here with a little introduction at, about what is a bowel obstruction and how you might uh, see it as a presentation. So first of all, what we're gonna be talking about today are mechanical bowel obstructions. Those are different from say functional bowel obstructions which you may encounter. Things like a ileus after surgery or what's known as acute colonic pseudo obstruction or Ogilvy syndrome. These are situations where there isn't actually a mechanical blockage, but the patient's acting functionally as if they're obstructed. So when we're talking about a mechanical bowel obstruction, we're really talking about a physical disturbance, an anatomical disturbance that's preventing the passage of contents through the gastrointestinal tract. These bowel obstructions might be complete in the sense that no gas or liquid passes or might be incomplete in the case that some contents might pass. The, those contents could be a little bit of gas, but also could be a little bit of uh, liquid contents. And certainly an incomplete bowel obstruction is more likely to resolve spontaneously, let's say, than a complete bowel obstruction. So it's worthwhile understanding those uh, two definitions. Now, when we talk about mechanical bowel obstructions, we should break them down into two broad categories. The first category is the anatomy. Is it a small bowel obstruction or is it a large bowel obstruction? And the approach to those two problems is gonna be different. The other thing to break it down is, does the bowel obstruction come from an adhesion or does it come from a non-adhesive cause? And the simple reason why that's important is that non-adhesive bowel obstructions inevitably need surgery or some form of intervention. So let's talk about that first category, large bowel versus small bowel. They have important different causes. And I think understanding what causes the bowel obstruction will help you understand what the risk is that this patient is presenting with something serious. So looking on the small bowel obstruction causes, the number one cause in North America of small bowel obstruction are adhesions from previous surgery. The next most common cause is a hernia, and the uh, third most common cause is some form of neoplasm, cancer. Intussusception is a cause, certainly in children. A gallstone alias is an uncommon cause in elderly populations, as well as foreign bodies and strictures. Large bowel obstructions, on the other hand, the number one cause is neoplasm, then we have diverticular disease and uh, volvulus as causes. And if you look at those causes, really all three of those causes are going to require some kind of surgical intervention to correct. So by breaking it down in your mind between a large bowel obstruction and a small bowel obstruction, you're gonna be able to help the patient and guide your management. Now, what is the key feature of a bowel obstruction? Well, the key feature is this concept of obstipation, and that's defined as the failure to pass gas and stool. That's opposed to constipation, which is a little bit of a different entity altogether. Constipation is the failure to pass stool, but you're still passing gas, and it has a particular time course, less than three bowel movements per, per week, or more than three days between a bowel movement. Obstipation, on the other hand, doesn't have a specific time course. Typically 12 hours would be the minimum I would consider someone to be obstipated, but you may find 24 hours or another uh, time uh, definition. Certainly, it's a significant enough period of time that the patient becomes quite symptomatic from their obstipation. So when we take the patient who is presenting with a small bowel obstruction, their presentation is gonna likely start like this. They're gonna have some colicky abdominal pain that's gonna move on to uh, nausea and vomiting, and then finally they're gonna develop some obstipation. Now what exactly is colicky pain? Well, what happens during a bowel obstruction is you have this fixed obstruction, and the intestines are trying to overcome that fixed obstruction. So there's an increase in the peristaltic waves that are happening. The action potentials of the small bowel are increasing as the bowel is trying to push against this obstruction. And when it's pushing and squeezing hard, the patient gets pressure in the lumen of the small bowel and they get this crampy abdominal pain. It only lasts for a minute before it resolves and then it occurs again. And this will continue until the patient develops a high-grade obstruction and an ileus and the bowel just completely stops uh, attempting to overcome the bowel obstruction. This, in the case of a small bowel obstruction, where you have the stomach that can act as a relief valve for the distension of the small bowel, you're going to get a lot of nausea and a lot of vomiting as fluid backs up into the stomach, you get 
stomach distension and the patient vomits to relieve that. And on the other hand, because you have no passage of stool or gas through that obstruction, then you get obstipation. Now, the patient might just complain of bloating initially and maybe a bit of abdominal uh, colicky pain because they may not have progressed to the more severe nausea, vomiting, and obstipation. They may actually have an additional episode of diarrhea because if you think about it, there's an area of, of obstruction, there's some squeezing intestinal contents in front of the obstruction, and there's actually action potentials in the small bowel beyond the obstruction that are, that are essentially dumping out those contents. So the, with an increase in intestinal activity initially, they may actually have some diarrhea before they actually develop obstipation. And in the same boat, you may actually have a brief episode of increased bowel sounds as the bowel is again trying to overcome this obstruction, but then eventually becomes silent or sort of tinkling type bowel sounds. When you're dealing with someone who might have a bowel obstruction, you'll notice a few things on examination. They may be uncomfortable during that colicky episode of pain. They actually might have some symptoms of tachycardia because they've been vomiting and dehydrated and they haven't been able to eat for a period of time. They will usually have some abdominal distension, and they may have some diffuse pain when you palpate. These patients are also typically quite tympanic because the intestinal tract is full of gas and uh, distended, and so you'll have a lot of tympani when you examine them. When you're examining a patient with a bowel obstruction, also be mindful of these red flags. If they have persistent hypotension or fever, that suggests that there's maybe uh, an area of bowel that's compromised from the bowel obstruction. They may have peritonitis, so if you're palpating the abdomen, there's focal tenderness or they have rebound tenderness or percussion tenderness, again, suggesting possibly a dead loop of small bowel as a result of the bowel obstruction. Or they may not have a history of uh, surgery at all, and that would put them in that non-adhesive category, which is high risk for some other serious pathology, like we mentioned, uh, neoplasm, for example. One of the key things I want you to think about when you're ever approaching a patient with a bowel obstruction is the key physical exam things. Look for surgical scars, which are gonna be a sign that they have had previous surgery. Evaluate for hernias. Perform a digital rectal examination to rule out rectal cancer and see actually if there's any stool in the rectum that could be contributing to a distal obstruction. And identify and look for uh, masses because the presence of a mass might suggest, again, a malignant or more serious cause of a bowel obstruction. Now, most patients with bowel obstruction present with abdominal pain and distension, nausea, vomiting, and that key feature, obstipation. But occasionally, a patient will present with, with abdominal distension. And one of the important differentials for abdominal distension is this issue of ascites. Ascites is essentially fluid in the peritoneal cavity that doesn't belong there. It can have uh, liver causes, malignant causes, cardiogenic causes, and it should be differentiated from the bowel obstruction. So a patient who has ascites will often have minimal pain or no pain at all. They'll have this classic bulging flanks picture. They'll have shifting dullness on examination, and they usually won't have a change in their bowel habit. Compare that to a bowel obstruction. There is usually pain associated with bowel obstructions. They have central distension. They're tympanic throughout, and they typically have nausea, vomiting, constipation, and obstipation, which are key features to making the diagnosis of a bowel obstruction. For the last slide in this module, this is an example of shifting dullness if you're not familiar with it. In the center, we have this tympanic area where you're percussing and you're identifying this tympanic sound. There's some sort of transition point and an area of dullness, and you can see the flanks here are described as dull. When you roll the patient over the side, now the transition point becomes more lateral, as you can see, they're becoming tympanic on the lateral side because the fluid has now shifted as the patient has rolled onto their side. And that's a feature that won't be present in a bowel obstruction. Bowel obstructions will be tympanic throughout and rolling them on the side, they will remain tympanic because again, there's no shift in uh, the fluid. And that's one of the key features. So that's the end of this first module. We're gonna move on to the next one where we're gonna talk about how we investigate bowel obstructions.